So you come from a heavy line of Mexican royalty. Of course, your grandfather, your dad. But yeah, I wish I really would have got to know him better and, and just ask them more questions like, ¿Cómo se siente ser el hijo de Pedro Infante? <laughs> That's big. You know, I was able to perform on the Latin Grammys on TV. So How did you feel performing? on that stage well i was nervous <laughs> like i couldn't breathe <laughs> how do you think uh your father's death affected you um this is the true hustle podcast with your host jr this is the true hustle podcast with your host jr hi how are you i'm good <laughs> <laughs> okay so it's been a long time coming i've been wanting you on for quite some time a couple months. Yeah, and I'm like, ah, oh, man, she's always on tour. What's going on here? But I yeah. see, I see you, you know, traveling a lot and and doing a lot of dope stuff. So congratulations. Thank you, thank you. So you come from a heavy line of Mexican royalty, like, of course, your grandfather, your dad. But people feel that you have that, um, like. Like, uh, like, you know, quote unquote, they say like a trust fund oh. or like, oh, <laughs> she has it made because her last name is Infante. Her grandfather's Pedro, her dad. Yeah. I don't think that was the case with you, though, right? Not really. At least maybe, you know, like in comparison, maybe to mm -hmm. other um famosos that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no but um i think that it's it's like two two ways to look at it because i think you know even growing up where i have as far as musically goes mm -hmm. i think having the last name infante does create like a perception it does give you maybe more attention absolutely i agree and then you have to bring what you got right absolutely but then and then there's the other side of it where people do think like oh yeah she's infante she hasn't made she's a nepo baby this and that it's just like <laughs> man you're like <laughs> no i not like that i think i i think i had a really like pretty standard like southeast l.a what what <laughs> growing up uh childhood i was telling your husband i didn't know you were from huntington park i just found out not so long ago <laughs> yeah and you know i'm from hp yeah so I, it makes me like it gets me excited to know yeah so we had a my well my mom had a, an apartment um right there on clarendon Ah, you said on this. <laughs> oh well, it used in front of the YMCA. It's still there, that apartment complex. Seville. Yeah, right. Well, it's not a YMCA anymore. I don't. It know. was. Yeah, it was. I used to go swim there as a Me kid. Me too. Oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, dope. That was the biggest pool I've ever seen in my life. Well, at, at the yeah, time. Yeah, I don't. Re I don't even remember. I was like little, but I took swimming lessons there. I know because there's like dope. video and pictures and stuff like that. But um, so, yeah, my mom had an apartment there and she worked for LAUSD. She still, okay. she still That's dope. does. And um, I went to um, Miramonte Elementary. Oh. With Somebody said that, that it's in uh, South Central, though. No, it's not is South it Central. HP? It's still HP. Okay. No, Miramonte. Is, is that crossing Alameda? I don't know. I don't know. You might want to Google that yeah, for us. Yeah, well, fact check us. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway. Because you're right. Somebody, I think it's on Holmes. Oh, anyhow. Somebody was okay. like, that's not even HP. And I'm like, okay, what, whatever. Close enough. Yeah. Because <laughs> my mom worked there. So. Okay. And then even our, our Downey mayor, Ma Mario Trujillo, mm -hmm. he was my teacher there. So, oh, that's dope. So, which is kind of crazy. Um, but anyway, uh yeah, once uh, when I was around seven, my mom, all by herself, her single self, decided to buy property in Downey, and she oh. bought a duplex. And um, yeah, I think that it got me out of HP, HP schools, and so when we were gonna go to the good Downey schools, and you know they're still full of raza <laughs> there too now and then too, but but yeah, I think it was a good move and. 
it was definitely yeah because our that apartment building like they had stolen from the garage you know there was Damn. a fire and i think she was like okay we gotta get out of here and i think to give people <clears throat> some perspective people that grew up in southeast la or like the south gate you know borderline la watts area moving to downey is like it's a big, big. deal it's a big deal <laughs> yeah like that ah, you made it <laughs> yeah. so i bet you <laughs> well actually i bet you that you're probably the coolest kid in elementary over there in miramonte yeah yeah because there's like people, ah, people knew yes people spoke spanish people knew they knew who pedro infante was they knew that and then my dad would show up to the school and i'm like ah. <laughs> 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 uh so you know it was a thing over there um but yeah coming to downey was like different and then i became like incognito like nobody knew my teachers were white so when you say you and your mom moved here yeah where was your dad in the picture so my dad had always kind of been in and out and <coughs> my mom and dad had like a long romance uh they fell in love like in 83 or 4 i don't know they met they met at the million dollar theater my mom was like a really beautiful lady she really? still is but back then she was like hot <laughs> <laughs> and and yes. i think you know my dad he was just my dad was a little wild you know he was living it up in the 80s rock star vibes and um he was performing all over the place he filmed a bunch of movies there was a lot of movies mm -hmm. uh, that came out of that era and um, my mom, I think she was in an acting school. So she, um, they gave her tickets to one of my dad's concerts at the Million Dollar Theater. And she oh, shows man. up. And supposedly, like, that my dad spotted her, like, as soon as she came in. Like, she came in. I don't know. I, I The way I pictured it. Damn, your head, dad had that 2020 vision? Like, ah! <laughs> like, more than that. You know? It's better than 2020. Oh, but, yeah, he, he had a thing. So then I think... He had like his manager or someone come and get my mom like, oh, do you want to meet Pedro Infante Jr.? And my mom was like, yeah, you know. And I could just picture them flirting like all oh, cursi, you know. Like, ah, <laughs> she said cursi. <laughs> I haven't heard that in a while. <laughs> uh, and then because I because I know how my mom is, you know, like she she could be very like. Mm -hmm. And then <laughs> my dad is just like. Uh, my dad can pass this can say uh so yeah um that was their story and 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 it's a funny story like you know back then there, there's no cell phones or anything so nope. like she gave my mom gave my dad my tia's number so then oh, my my dad shit. calls my tia's house and is like Hola, uh, habla Pedro Infante puedo hablar con Marisol or whatever and um and then my tía se sacó de onda. She was like, Pedro Infante. Ah, cabrón. Si ya está muerto. <laughs> she, she was tripping out. And then I think later on, my, you know, she told my mom, like, hey, te estaba buscando un Pedro Infante. Ah, sí, es que lo conocí, you know. Da, da, da. And then the, I guess that's, you know, they have their whole romance story. And so my dad was kind of in and out. He would tour a lot here in L.A. Mm -hmm. And um, he... He was kind of, you know, all over the place. But he, they tried to settle down together when I was like a teenager, but mm -hmm. it, it didn't work out. It was mm. too. Hmm. He, he was living that, uh, uh, what's it called, rock star lifestyle? He, he really was. Maybe it was a little yeah. bit too much. He was too much. And then, you know, my dad, he's like a Mexican guy. He comes into our lives and he's like trying to tell us how to live our lives. And we're just like, boy. <laughs> 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 Like, especially for me, you know, growing up, because my mom was my authority. She was always uh, working. She mm -hmm. worked her whole life. So I feel like that's, you know, I inherited that. Like, I want to work. I love working. Mm -hmm. That's what I she modeled to me. And um, so it was kind of like she did whatever the hell she wanted. She had her own money. She was just, like, living her independent life. And then, yeah, my dad comes in and it's kind of like, oh, pues, voy a poner mis reglas. And, and we're just like, nah. Shit. The nah, super machista. <laughs> the super machista aquí se come a las tres o a las cuatro. Y 
vamos a hacer todo así. Your mom's probably like, I've like been that. paying these bills the whole time. <laughs> like, what's going on sweet. here? My mom was sweet. She was more like, <coughs> you know, she was down, but then, but I wasn't, you know. I was like, no. And my dad was a good cook, so I remember that. Like, he would make some really good food. And my mom wouldn't really cook. We didn't find out that my mom could cook until the pandemic when she was home. Oh, no way. We're like, you can make chiles rellenos? Like, what? You know, <laughs> Where was this at my whole life? <laughs> But, but yeah, so it was an interesting, um, you know, growing up. So that was, so when my dad was living with us, that's, we were in Paramount actually. So mm -hmm. after uh, Downey, we had a place in Paramount. Then we came back to, to Downey again. And then my dad kind of, he did his own thing. And, but he, he moved to LA after that mm. point. So he was closer and. We'd hang out sometimes when, because he was just up and down. He was like always moving, always busy. And he would always tell me, Vente conmigo, andale. He, he would love it when I'd go visit him, spend the night. And, but he was an interesting guy. And I feel like I didn't take advantage of like really getting to know him. Because, you know, obviously, like I didn't know he was going to pass away. It was just like we're just living our lives, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, I wish I really would have, you know, got to know him better and. And just ask them more questions like, ¿Cómo se siente ser el hijo de Pedro Infante, güey? Wow. <laughs> That's big. You know? Just, but we would just, like, chill. Like, he, he liked watching movies. He liked listening to, like, um, I think it's K-Jazz. Like, he'd always, mm. he, eh, eh, no matter where he, like, moved or went, he always, <laughs> like, had his setup. Like, he would make his bed, like, mm -hmm. kind of, like, chill vibes, like, kind of mm -hmm. romantic-ish. And then he would like put little speakers on the side of his bed, <laughs> like before you could even buy them. And like he would have his whole setup, and he was like an interesting guy. And and yeah. But what would it be something that you would want to ask him that you would want to know? Um, I I think I would try to go like deep dive into his like inner emotions and and traumas. Like how did he grow up? Like his parents, his mom, like what did he go through? Um, because I think he had a lot of like inner pain that he mm. didn't really deal with. I, I think I would have tried to do that. But at that time, you know, I was like kind of a little bit checked out emotionally too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as, as you age, you get your emotional maturity and yeah, all that. So, I agree. Um, <laughs> But now, now looking back, you know, as a like more healed Latina where I'm like looking at all my traumas and everything I've gone through, even with my dad's death and, and even dealing with his addictions and all of that, mm. you know, I think, <coughs> yeah, looking back, I think I would have, if I could, like me now, mm -hmm. right, ask him, I'd, I'd probably go there with him and try to have like more of a heart to heart absolutely yeah i think uh the older we get the more mature we get oh yeah and you were a kid yeah I, I was. A, you were probably like not concerned about certain things no I, I was and then i think a lot of us like growing up latinos first gen we're kind mm -hmm. of in survival mode and we don't even know it we're just kind of mm -hmm. like living our lives like boom 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 going on to the next things happen you don't really process it you're just like survival mode the whole time and just trying to figure out life and i agree stuff. yeah but it has but you're right it's more like the first generation like us yeah cause there's a lot of things you know that that we don't realize that how our parents grow up and all of their traumas, how they were affected by their environment, how their parents treated them. They come here and like, I mean, can you imagine like you picking up your whole family, moving to a whole ass country, new language, trying to figure out a whole system. And your parents are like on survival mode, like, boom, boom, we just got to get this shit done. And then, you know, like, can you imagine us doing that? Like, it's a lot. And we don't even talk about it. We don't process it. We're just like... I, you know, surviving. I processed it and I, I stopped blaming my parents for a lot of things yeah. because I'm like, fuck, survival <laughs> mode yeah. with kids. 
working in another country, doing this. And then like, oh, well, you didn't hug me as much. <laughs> yeah, because you had to pay bills. <laughs> yeah. I process a lot of things. You yeah. know, and I think it's healthy. It is healthy. You know? I think we, we should do it. <coughs> and, and it takes time. I think we're we're all gonna get there. But it takes I think time. time heals everything though. For sure. Yeah. And I think the older we get, the wiser we get. And the more we look at the big picture. Yeah. As kids, we don't know what it is. Para el pinche vil de la luz. <laughs> yeah. To pay a mortgage. Yeah. Imagine in a whole new country. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. And then it makes you I'm more understanding. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah, me too. Me too. Me too. How do you think uh your father's death affected you? Um, it was really hard for me. Um, cuz it was really unexpected and I think it really changed my life cuz I was I was a little bit like checked out emotionally just like kind of going through the motions of things and mm -hmm. I think it made me like wake up and like you know I think I want to do more than what I'm doing with my life and that's kind of how I started my music journey and really started searching for more like and and um and then trying to find a lot of healing too. Mm -hmm. That's kind of when my emotional maturity process journey, you know, healing started. So um, it was it was really tough. Um, but yeah, like I, I don't know if people really know out there, or if they're chismosos, they probably know. <laughs> <laughs> But um, so it was reported that my dad committed suicide. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little more complex than that. So my dad battled with addiction for a long time. He was alone and paramedics found him. And he told paramedics that he had um, like done something to himself. Mm -hmm. Like because they said that he had some stab wounds. He said he did it to himself. We don't really know. It could have been somebody else. I don't know. I have no idea what really happened. But he told them that he did that to themselves. So we're kind of just going by what happened or what was said. Mm -hmm. He was. Um, he didn't die. He got. He went to the hospital. Um, he didn't die, um, and he was in the hospital for like two months. And what's crazy is that we didn't know. We didn't know mm -hmm. until like a week later that everything happened and that this happened on my birthday. So every time oh. my birthday happens, I, I think about that because I remember that day specifically. He called me in the morning and he sang happy birthday because that's what he did like to all his kids. Um, he would always call us or my mom or my grandma, like everybody. He would just call and sing Las Mañanitas. So he called um, that day. And he, he asked me, like, ¿qué vas a hacer? And then at that time, my mom was already, like, dating somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, pues, no sé, no sé, no, nada, yo creo. And there was a dinner going on, but then... You couldn't tell him. I, I could have told them, I think, you know, but then I knew my mom was going <coughs> to bring her date. And I'm like, I'm going to be fucking awkward, dude. I'm just, I'm not going to tell him because I don't want, like, drama shit. Like, just let's keep it simple, right? So ya no le dije so... How old were you? I was 22. I was 22. Oh, entonces ya estabas grande. I was like, grande pero mensa todavía, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Como todos los 22-year-olds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, so, yeah, and so I felt a lot of guilt, you know, because later we find out he's in the hospital. And then we're like, what? Like, what happened? And then we start finding out, like, okay, the paramedics this, they told us that, that he might have ingested something. He's been in the hospital. They didn't know he had insurance because he had insurance because him and my mom, you know, even though they separated, they were married, he had insurance. So they just kind of picked him up like mm -hmm. as a person off the street. He, he changed his name in the hospital. Like, so people didn't know who he was, what he was, whatever. And then, um, so then once we found out, we're like, hey, no, like, let's get him the care he needs. He has insurance. Blah, blah. But, but at that point, he was already, like, on breathing tubes and, like, for two months, like, agonizing, like, pretty badly. Yeah. It, it was really bad. And so we would go visit him in the hospital. He was out there in Riverside. So, you know, driving out there. And I was working part-time, going to school, community college. 
it was hard, you know. It was just like, it was it was bad. And and then, well, eventually, yeah, the family decided, like, we, we got to take him off this life support because oh. I don't think it's good for him. And it's kind of, you know, everyone has to make that choice when you have a family member that's just kind of suffering. Yeah. So, well, the, and then that's, that's how he passed away. So oh, that must have been tough to make that decision. It's tough. We had to make that decision for my, for my father-in-law. It's, it's really hard. Oh, man. It's really hard. So, you know, but I think everybody felt guilty because mm. we were like, damn, like we didn't help him. We turned our backs on him, you know, but I think it's really hard when you have somebody in the family with like those kinds of issues with addiction. You don't know what to do anymore. There comes a point where there's like gases, you know. How old was he? <clears throat> he was like, he was 50, 58, 59. He was young. Yeah, still. he was pretty young. Yeah. Yeah. But and I've never talked about this actually anywhere exclusive so. right here <laughs> that means a lot is, to me this is exclusive but i think it's important because people you know think that everything's perfect in every family especially like uh, famous people family like no like there's some fucked up shit everywhere and it, i'm normal pretty pretty normal i had a super normal upbringing um but it's it's an interesting story because of where i come from um, but yeah, we have issues like everybody else. Everybody has issues. <laughs> and anybody that says that they don't is full of shit. <laughs> I don't care how much money, <laughs> how much fame, we all go through issues. Yeah. And we deal with them differently. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And I think, you know, after <coughs> all, all these years and a lot of like healing and finding, um, how to just better myself, how to find myself in mm -hmm. the whole situation. I think I've done a pretty damn good job. Do you think uh, <clears throat> dealing with grief has challenges and has different stages? Yeah, like yeah, of course. Definitely, yeah. I think, um, you know, sometimes I still cry, like, over when I think about him and just everything but at the same time i feel like i i accepted mm -hmm. you know what has happened and and um and i think it's now it's just part of my story you know that that all of this has happened and and i think um music has always been a part of my life but mm -hmm. i think during that time i really filled my life with a lot of music through school so i went to community college did the whole, i was there for like 10 years which one <laughs> which one well i went to cerritos <laughs> but then i <laughs> i flunked out of math so many times i had to go to fucking elac to do math that's where i went <laughs> but just because like i couldn't get my shit together with math because i'm just i'm like that you know dyslexic ass latina over here <laughs> Whatever, but makes two I, of us. <laughs> Fucking hate math. <laughs> two plus two. I know that, but that's about it. <laughs> but eventually, okay, you know, I got it done, and then I was able to transfer to UCLA. What? Um, what? Graduated from there with my undergrad in ethnomusicology, and that made a big difference in my life because for the first time, I was like in a whole other environment with you know, like intellectuals and people who were talking about mm -hmm. the world and like it was getting out of my little, East, you know, Southeast LA bubble. It's just this little bubble that we live in. Yeah. And then you totally. start finding fucking different views, different de todo, de todo ethnicities. Yeah. And you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> it happened to me. Yeah. I'm like Indian people. I never, what the yeah. fuck? And like, I went, like when I went to Cal State, yeah, it was... <laughs> A culture shock for me. Yeah, totally. Like, right? uh, uh, you're not Mexican. <laughs> yeah. You're not. Oh you don't God. eat tacos. <laughs> what the fuck? Like, so yeah. It yeah, to I me. thought everyone was Mexican too. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy, right? <laughs> we like my husband and I laugh about it because like he he's way more diverse than me because he grew up in like the good part of LA. Um, and what's the good part? <laughs> what's the good part? Where'd La, you grow up? La Cañada. Oh La Cañada. shit. 
he comes from money. And I just get it. <laughs> That's what's up, bro. He's like the poor kid from like <laughs> <laughs> Shit. But um, but yeah, like like he has like Jewish friends. I never had Jewish friends until now. Now so, I have Jewish friends. Yeah, yeah. Now I have all kinds of friends. But I back guess. then, we we're like, ¿Qué? Yeah. <laughs> ¿Qué es eso? Ay, Dios. Yeah. Okay. Your major. Yeah. What is it again? Ethnomusicology. Ethnomusicology. Could you explain what that consists of? Yeah. So it's basically an undergrad degree in world music. And it's kind of like where music history and anthropology which is like the study of culture mm -hmm. kind of meet and you're just basically studying any kind of music that is non-classical aka like non-white classical okay music. so you're not really doing like the beethoven mozart schumann stuff you're more in like okay like what the music of the people like in my case it was okay. mariachi Mariachi is what I was like really interested in and like Pedro Infante and that whole era and how that shaped mm -hmm. how we feel as Mexicans and how we identify with that as like being Mexican. I thought okay. that was really interesting. So I kind of, yeah. Now that you bring classical music up, I've always had this question since you study for it. <laughs> is it true that classical music is stimulating and makes you smarter not smarter mm -hmm. like like when it comes to school like if oh. you're listening to classical music it stimulates you and you apply yourself more is that true is it stimulating um i think it, it goes beyond that i feel like if you're able to do like a music appreciation class mm -hmm. where you not only learn about like not just listening to the music while you're doing homework i feel like you, when you learn the history and about why that music was played and and how i think it's that's more like the arts themselves having the arts in school <laughs> mm -hmm. um learning an instrument you know the discipline of an instrument i think that's what really can shape a mm, human okay more so than just like ah, pues voy a ponerle aquí para Pa ponerme más pilas. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I guess maybe, more smarticles over here. <laughs> like, I don't article. know the the studies or yeah. whatever. I'm sure that there there's been studies made on it, and um, I I think yeah, if you're listening to it, if you can kind, of, but if you understand it, I think that's mm -hmm. more than just like. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. This episode is brought to you by the JR Group, located in the beautiful city of Downey, California. If you're thinking about buying, selling, investing, or refinancing your property, go ahead and make sure that you connect with us via Instagram. Follow us at JR Jimenez RE. Go ahead and send us a DM and let's connect. So when you graduated, that's yeah. when you took uh, the deep dive into like your music or what? Mm. How did you transition from, okay, I went to school, I did this, I did X, Y, and Z. Now I'm fully focused yeah. on my singing career. So, okay, <coughs> it, it all went like hand in hand. So I was at Cerritos College and then what, what? I was doing like your local like St. Dominic Savio Fair, like uh -huh. the carnival or whatever. I was singing there and um, little gigs here and there at the Alameda Swamp Meet or at, my childhood <laughs> there. At, oh, you know like little things like that where you're just like getting the experience um of being in front of a crowd and mm -hmm. and singing songs and learning songs so it, it just kind of went hand in hand and because people kind of knew who i was mm -hmm. i think they would like throw me into different stuff mm -hmm. that i wasn't ready for but pues así aprendí, you know pues así es como se aprende yeah. Meses, huh? yeah. Like, vámonos al cien. Ah, que, oh, <laughs> throw them in there. It's like that little meme that I seen, like Latino parents teaching their kids how to swim. You'll survive. We'll let you, you know, hasta que we feel like, ay, wait, no, se va a ahogar. Then we'll pick you up. But yeah, so just kind of doing that. And then I got into uh, recording. So I started recording stuff before I even knew what the hell I was doing. 
And I recorded a whole little like CD while I was going to UCLA. And that was like my first unofficial, my, like my, my mixtape. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on a CD? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, he, you know, after UCLA is when I auditioned for Lavos Mexico. And then through there, I met my management. Mm -hmm. And through my management, they kind of became like my mentors and have really showed me about the business of music uh -huh. versus it's like I, the whole time, like, I don't know, 10, 15 years, I was learning the craft. Still, you're always learning the craft, mm -hmm. but I was just learning the craft. And then I transi transitioned into like, okay, the music business. So then you got into music after your dad passed. So it's not like you were, mm -hmm. he wasn't coaching you and like telling you, mija, si, you do well, this or you do that. Not, no, yes and no. Cause like everywhere he went, if I was there, he would, he would pull me up to the stage and he, no he would way. have me sing with him. And it was always a song, Cien Años. Like that's what we would sing together. Um, but he, he was never like, oh, I'm gonna make like a star out of you. Like, mm, okay. aprendete estas canciones. Like, let me, he wasn't like that. <coughs> he he kind of just, let me do my thing and then in school i was always in choir i was in guitar lessons i had a teacher that my mom met at the saint dominic savio that he played in the coro no <laughs> <laughs> so he became my teacher uh a colombian guitar guitarist so he taught me how to play guitar and um it was cool because he, you know, despite being Colombian, he taught me all the Mexican songs like really? Lindo, Allá en el Rancho Grande. Dang. So it was, it was really cool that I got exposure to that at a young age. Um, so there was always music there, but not in like this professional capacity mm, where okay, it's like, so. we're going to make you the next Pedrito Fernandez type of thing. No, like no, no child star thing. It was just, okay. but it was there. And how do you think? La Voz changed everything for you. Well, because I got to meet my management, which was a big, has been a big part of building my my career. Um, the show itself was crazy. I didn't know because it's a reality show, and they really want you to be like a savage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. And it's like I'm just not. I mean, maybe I am, like in my personal life, like. But, like, you know, I think I'm pretty calm. I like to mm -hmm. keep things chill. I don't want to fight with people. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're just like me. Like, ah, there's no room for that drama. Yeah. It's I like don't know. Too, like, too, too much. much. Too much. Tanto pedo. Like, <laughs> I, no, I, I don't want that in my life. Exactly. You know, so I don't know. Maybe they wanted you to just do all kinds of shit that you're probably like, no, why would I do that? Yeah, and then also because of my like last name i think they wanted me to throw like all kinds of that kind of drama mm -hmm. into it i'm like no nah, chill so then you made your management and then everything took off after that well not like just took off but i think it was like a process of like okay so we're gonna find um like a distribution deal mm -hmm. for for music and then there came a recording budget and then we're gonna find um we're gonna develop you as a songwriter so i was kind of songwriting a little bit um but then they got me in the studio songwriting with really amazing songwriters like luciano luna mm -hmm. and erica vidrio who are huge in in mexican music and then that one of my first sessions with luciano luna a song came out of that and that was um a couple a uh, year later a couple years i don't know how long exactly but like af at least a year later um a grammy nomi latin grammy nomination came what? because of that yeah. songwriting session so then things started to happen and then because of that nomination i was able to perform on the latin grammys on tv so you know and then that came with you know it's like that's how you build like little things turn into like other things and then that'll open another opportunity so stuff like that started to happen little by little how did you feel performing on that stage 
Well, I was nervous. <laughs> like, I couldn't breathe because <laughs> of the dress was so tight. Oh, shit. <laughs> And then, like, I was wearing heels. My legs were shaking so bad. And I got to perform with Mariachi Sol de Mexico, one of my favorite mariachis, uh, El Maestro Jose Hernandez, who he's the director. He wrote out this, like, really beautiful arrangement of Amorcito Corazon. And um, so we got to perform it together. And then he was nominated. I was nominated. And it was just really nice. It was nice. That performance is it's out there, like, on – well, I have it on my website – but it's, uh, I think it's out there on YouTube. Um, I'm sure it is. And then we released um, a recording of it later, which is one of the recordings that people really like the most. From, Do you think yeah. that's one of the highlights of your, of your career? I think it's, it, yeah, that was a highlight. Like that whole thing of like being nominated and the performance, that recording, like I think it's been one of the high points for sure. I think your dad's cheering for you up there. You better. He's like, yeah, no, I think. Some mica cabrones. <laughs> no, for sure. You know, I, the, I the Mexican in them, yeah. like, cabrones, you know? I, I totally could see him being like that. Yeah. That's super cool. Yeah. So, oh, man. It's just um, the super Mexican. I just think that all Mexican parents are, like, kind of, like, the same, <laughs> you know? Because, like, when I talk about like oh, you know old school Mexican parents, yeah. it just reminds me of mine. Oh yeah. And I would just picture how my parents would be if I was on that stage, like yeah, says mi hijo cabrones. Yeah, I think one of the biggest like joys is watching my mom be so proud, especially because she helped me, like when I was going to school and all this. Like she she was supportive. <coughs> like maybe not like like in the way that. She, I had the guidance of mm -hmm. like, you know, but at least she was like, you know, live here. You're not going to pay rent type of thing. Um, and just always like cheering me on. And when I graduated, she was so thrilled and like so proud. I don't know if it was like that for you where they were just. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I cried. Yeah. Aww. I don't think me and my dad have ever hugged and cried. Well, actually, I know we never had. <laughs> I want to pretend like I was loved as a kid. <laughs> That's fucked up. But that was the most probably tender, loving moment that I had with my dad. Like, Isn't that like, crazy? And, like, like, he fucking sobbed like a, like he was a kid. Yeah. And I'm like, and I couldn't help it. So I'm like, ah, we're both crying. And my parents, and I'm just like, it's like the inner kid came out of them. I mean, I, I don't have. And then for my mom, she was all, she was always like, "Primero la escuela y luego haces lo que lo que quieras. No te vas a casar hasta que termines la escuela." Like that was her thing. Like you had to. So I felt guilty if I didn't finish school, even if it was like for something like music. Like nobody does music. They do something practical that you can make money from. You know. <laughs> yeah, you're right about that. I was like, tienes que. But I just think that now, as adults, yeah, yeah, that's so valuable. It huh? is, yeah. Like, no vas a hacer esto y esto y esto hasta que acabes esto, car. Y paga tus pinches bills a tiempo. I remember my dad telling me certain things as, or me listening to him saying certain things, and it just stuck with me. Yeah. Like my mom, my dad, it's just certain things that I'm like, at the time we were kids, but it stuck with us. All those values, those morals. Mm -hmm. And look at us now. Grown, responsible adults. <laughs> you know, graduating from UCLA. That's fucking dope. That's super dope. So, your mom played a role, like a fatherly role as well. She played like both roles. For sure. She was definitely out there hustling ever since i could remember she's always had like two jobs she still has two jobs no way and uh she's all happy right now she's like she's making so much money she like yeah? talks about it like <laughs> me presume like Mira, ya me, ya me cayó el direct deposit, mira. <laughs> yeah, dude, do your parents no. do that? <laughs> dude, my mom. Like, I'll tell you, I'm Mexican, Mexican for real. <laughs> like, 
And then I'll be like, a ver, entonces págame la vez que llegué, llevé a tu perro al, al veterinario. He's like, no, pues no tengo dinero. <laughs> My dad be trying that. to flex and I'll be like, hey, ¿qué no me debes aquella vez? <laughs> yeah. Cabrón, te di la vida, hijo de la chingada. <laughs> entonces, ¿para qué me andas presumiendo? Le digo. <laughs> Yeah. And, then, and then my mom. All toxic. <laughs> oh, my mom being like with her little purse. You know, I don't know if your mom has, you know. This is 20 or 100? This is Like, and I just be like, pues, ¿cuándo me van a invitar a comer, pues? Dude, I was thinking about that right now. You know, like, all right, all this fucking money. Uh, you know, and they'll take me. But the funny part is, <coughs> if they do invite me, Guess where they're going to take me to? Mi ranchito in Huntington Park. <laughs> they it, no salen. Is it good? It's cool. Oh, I like it. Okay. But I like my mom's food better. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like homemade food. So for me to go to a restaurant and eat Mexican food, it's kind of, it's kinda, I, I kind of don't do it. Yeah. Like you can't go from homemade to that. No, it's because there, there's nothing like homemade. <laughs> So let's say we have this segment, How Mexican Are You? <laughs> if you go to a restaurant, uh -huh. what are you going to order? Chilaquiles or huevos rancheros? Mm, I'm, a, I'm a more of a chilaquiles girl. Yeah, me too. Red or green? Uh, I think I usually do green. <laughs> I do green. I do green too. But then again, I'll do both. I don't care. I just <laughs> love chilaquiles. I like to I like I like I love chips. Like just give me the chips. All right, you no, set like, yourself up like for this one. Uh, not, not. How <laughs> do you like hot Cheetos though? I mean, I eat hot Cheetos. I just think I'm I have an addiction to potato chips. Period. I don't know if it's common amongst I know he is. Like I love flaming hot. I love chips. I love lays. I love, and I just add a gang of tapatio. Well, not no more because I got sick. But anyways, there's. I mean, I'm not that obsessed with <laughs> chips. There's only one chips that I like, and they're. I think they're called like sabritonas. Like sabritas? Sa no, Can? they're like. They're they're like they're not real chicharron, but they're like kind of chicharron pero de masa, and. The, Oh, okay. And it almost okay. tastes like it has like tahin, like a. Oh, I know which ones. Like I it's three hundred percent sodium. <laughs> <laughs> I love those. That that's the only ones that I like. I'm really into. Well, I mean, those are. I'm, I'll eat them. You my mouth but, is watering. Um, <laughs> but, um, thinking about the freaking um, flamey hots. Yeah, that's good. So, let's get back to the. I, I've heard. That when you were going to school, doing certain, uh, pursuing your singing career, you were still driving for Lyft. Well, they always say that, but they, they get it mixed up. So it was actually after I had graduated. And it was during the time I was like on La Voz Mexico. Because mm -hmm. basically I had to go to Mexico and be there for like a month. Mm -hmm. And then, like, I had bills and all kinds of shit to pay. So coming back, then I was driving for Lyft when I was, yeah. That, to me, is a true hustle moment. Yeah. It was easy, you know? It's it was like, like something you can just jump into. Because people are so quick to put excuses and to say, ah, fuck it. Nah, man, you could do what you have to do. Mm -hmm. And to me... That story did something for me. I'm like, damn. Because be, be, when I was at, when I was going to school, I was actually a music teacher. I worked in Southgate at the music store. Which one? The one on, on Tweety? Tweety. Yeah. Arrow? No way. I worked there for like, I think like eight years or something. I don't know how. It was a long time, but I was a music teacher. So when I was here, I could teach, you know, I music know and be um, consistent making my little coins and whatever but then when i was gone when i had to like be jumping back and forward and be in mexico it's like i couldn't just teach i had 
I had to do more. So the lift was actually awesome. And then later when I got nominated, That's fucking dope. they were really cool. Like we did a little collab and we did like kind of like for social media, like a commercial, like they were really supportive of my nomination and like put me out there. So shout out to Lyft because they're, they're awesome. I just think that whole, the, the theory and that story itself, it's just that no matter what, you just have to call, you well, yeah. keep going. Like, what are you going to do? Not pay your bills, not, nah, man. You have to keep going, and people, are, it's easier to just say fuck it, nah. I'm not, I'm not scared to work. I'm Mexican. <laughs> I was gonna say, who'd you get that from? <laughs> yeah, like that's what I've been modeled, and I, you know, I think for a lot of us, you know, first gen kids with our parents who are like blue collar people, we just, you know. We, we it, work it wasn't too much we work I, too much i just think uh no offense to nobody <laughs> the new generations but the first generation damn we had we had it pretty good huh yeah i mean well why what's wrong with Be the second one no i just think that the hard work was instilled in us oh i see i see you know now things have change and um we've seen it firsthand we've seen the hard work firsthand from our parents yeah because they migrated here mm -hmm. they came somewhere where they weren't you know like this is like foreign country and they're out here trying to make it and yeah. i think we got to we we experienced that firsthand yeah. Don't get mad, Gen Zs or what, what is it, the millennials or whatever. <laughs> you know, I just think we had. W what are some of the memories? Which that, is good because I, I think even us, like our parents, want to make it better for us, so they did. And then I think us. I mean, I don't have kids, but I know you have kids. Yes. But you want to make it better for Absolutely. your kids. Absolutely. Maybe like even in having that guidance that they that you didn't have, or you know, having it easier. So I I could see that. But then probably you still have that like, no, a chingarle cabron, like. <laughs> I do. I want to just teach my kids that none of this shit is easy and nothing's going to be handed to you. Mm. That's what I want to instill. Do you, do you make in, in, them work for their stuff, like allowance or like, how, how, are you as strict as your parents? Probably not, huh? Yee. He's criticizing the, no. the second okay. gen as he's okay. raising them. <laughs> Listen, a ver, a ver. I'm not as strict, but I can be. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. I've been blessed with real great kids. So it's like, I need to lead by example and show them yeah, yeah, that aquí se va, le vas a chingar. Mm -hmm. there, there's no fucking handouts here. Yeah. And I want them to see me always working. It's just a thing that I, I, I enjoy it. But I think. Me leading by example is showing them like, damn, my dad don't play. Mm -hmm. A chingarle. But I am firm when I have to be. But then sometimes I'm a fucking big ass teddy bear to my daughter. Like, it's hard for me to be like, you know, so I, I try to find a balance and I try to lead by example. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to get at. Because so. maybe our parents didn't have as much balance. There wasn't. I don't think so. I think it, for them, it was just like work, 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 survival. And then maybe us as a more healed generation, we can maybe find the balance and like, you know. When do you think you started healing from all my bullshit, from <laughs> from the upbringing, from your upbringing, from the passing of your father? Like, when did yeah. you start healing and what did you do? Well, it's been a process. And, and then at one point I was in like an outpatient rehab where I was taking classes to be sober. Um, Cause I thought I had like a marijuana problem, but then mm -hmm. it, and I was like, oh yeah, I, I just need help. Like maybe quitting marijuana. And then they were like, well, you can't just quit marijuana. You have to quit alcohol. And I was like, well, no, I don't really have a problem with alcohol. And, and then they were like, okay, well then just quit. And then I was like, oh, I guess I'm <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so then well, I, I guess I kind of do. <laughs> and then, you know, and then I was like, oh, okay, you know. But so I then I got sober for a little while. Um, and sometimes I, I, I still have periods of like sobriety of um, of everything. Okay. I don't really smoke weed anymore, but um, every now and then. No, not even, not even. Yeah, Te pendeja mucho. And then you <laughs> fucking eat everything. But like, I think, <laughs> and then you eat everything. I think alcohol is is harder, especially because of what I do, and it's like it's part it's like part of the culture. Yes. Like singing out there and like you want to take a shot with like while you're singing these like heart you know wrenching Jose Alfredo song and you're like Salad. You know? <laughs> so it's 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 tough but you know I try to like measure myself have a balance but um yeah so back when I after my dad passed away I did find um help and resources to like understand like my own addiction my own problems and then even and, and I think it helped me understand my dad too um and yeah, so but it's it's been a, a long journey of like trying to understand and heal and process mm -hmm. everything, you know. Still, yeah. I think still, I think healing is an ongoing thing for. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, but I just think that um, alcohol and drugs, it's like it resets everything. It just puts you back in step one mm. of like the healing process. Because technically, alcohol is a, it's a depressant, right? Yeah. So it's a that's why I choose, you know, personally for me. Just sober. Just completely. Because we don't realize, oh, for me, I didn't realize that drinking was a problem for me. Because mm. it's our culture. Yeah. Who the fuck? Every quinceañera, all the deals <laughs> are getting fucked up. Yeah. Every bautizo, fucked up. Bro, there's no reason why a bautizo should be 10 hours. <laughs> <laughs> Am I fucking tripping? Like, no, llegamos a las cinco y hasta las tres de la mañana nos vamos. What kind of fucking... No, like, you know, so then it's normal. So yeah. me growing up in high school and drinking and all that, I didn't realize that it was like a problem. Until I'm like, okay, well then just quit. Oh, I guess it is a problem. <laughs> yeah. So to me, it's like, ah, i rather just not. And then I don't like the hangovers. I don't, yeah, I don't either. It, it does. So I wear this whoop thing, it's mm -hmm. like a measuring of all your kind of, I don't know, vitals and your really strain, how well you sleep. And then every time I have even just one thing of alcohol, like it lowers my uh, heart rate variability. Um, it just messes with me. And I could tell, like, the de the data shows. <laughs> yes, so. The data shows that alcohol is really bad for me. It is. And, and probably for everybody, you know? So I don't know what happens, like, on a cellular level, but I'm sure it's, like, fucking up shit. I, I'm going to say that I think there's a chemical imbalance in your brain that happens. To me, I feel. No, like, like, like chemical imbalance, yeah, ahí está. You know, the, the, si tomo, the no, ahí está la <laughs> For me, I just feel that, fuck, cuando, yeah, don't drink, because yeah, it's just. It's better if you don't, but, I mean, I get it, too, because, like, I've been there, and mm -hmm. everyone has to go through their, through their journey, through their process, but I think that hopefully, you know, people are, are trying to search for more, mm -hmm. trying I to agree. get out of you know, their hole or whatever, their trauma. And I think uh, there's healthy ways to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. People always turn to alcohol and drugs mm -hmm. because it's... Like an escape, no? Of course, you know? Yeah. I just think it's like self-medicating. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's healthy ways to do things, mm -hmm. you know? And if they need help, I know that our culture is against therapy. Mm. But sometimes... Until they see that it works. You know, like and sometimes you don't lose nothing. If you're feeling some type of way, you might as well just give it a shot. Yeah. You know? What's the worst thing that can happen? You're already feeling you're you're already feeling bad. So Yeah, why not? Why do you think that is? Why is our culture so taboo y about stuff? Yes, against therapy and expressing yourself and telling somebody about your problems. I think part of it, like, 
Because I think a lot of the people who migrate are like people who are like in ranchos, mm. in, in cultures and situations that were more like cerrados. And then uh-huh. you didn't have time. Like I talk to my husband about this all the time. Like you didn't have time to like sit there and cry. Like go fucking take the vacas out and go like ordeñarlas, get the cheese ready, wake up. You think they had time to like just sit there and cry and talk about problems? Hell no. They were just like, they had to do the thing to survive. Survival mode. So we talked about that. I think it's just like, the way that they, you know, kind of were raised and the way that things had to be in order for them to, you know, live. So I think yeah. that's part of it, you know. There was no time for it. There's no time for feelings and Fuck. crying and. Yeah. I remember when, as a kid, when I would be like, hey, like, ¿quieres llorar? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Te voy a hacer llorar de verdad, cabrón, con una madriza que te voy a poner. <laughs> and then I think that sticks with a lot of us. Mm-hmm. Like we can't show emotions. We can't, you know, show. And I think partly we shouldn't. But then it's okay to express yourself. It's like it has to be a healthy balance, too. Because I believe in raising strong men as well. Mm. And I don't think men should be soft. I think we need to be strong. But there has to be a healthy balance. Do do you agree with me or do you think yeah. it's still the machista in me? Well, <coughs> it depends like what kind of strength. But I think if, if you can have a, a man... Or women that are like spiritually strong, mentally strong, where they don't, you know, let just anything come into their head and um, come up, like influence mm-hmm. them. I think that that's a good kind of strength, em- like emotional strength, where it's like, you know, just because they're having issues, they're not gonna go to a substance. Mm. You know, they they they, you know, I think that's important. For for our generation, uh, for us too, you know, yeah, make I ourselves agree. strong and 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 then our kids. But I, I definitely think, yeah, that kind of thing is important. I agree. I agree, for sure. I just believe that we need to raise strong men, but have that balance. Not just be strong in one area, like just in general, like uh, you know. I don't know about making sense, but but so yeah. like like you think they can't be crybabies? <laughs> I just think there's a time and a place. Okay, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. You know, it's like I'm not gonna in the day and age of social media, mm-hmm. for example. Oh yeah, I'm gonna make a video of me crying about certain things. Yeah, like uh, I, you know, as a man, like uh, I just think there's a time and a place. I'm not saying don't cry. But I'm saying, like, you're still a man. Go cry over there. <laughs> you know, like, I'm, that's just me being honest. Have you seen guys post that kind of stuff? Uh, yeah, I've seen, you know, a, a lot of things. But not just in social media, like, <laughs> a lot of you know, like, I've seen a whole lot of, it's like, it's like a different world. I'm still new to that world that I'm just like, what the fuck is happening? Yeah. But I just feel that there's a time and a place for everything. Yeah. And that. Yes, be in tune with your feelings. Mm -hmm. Yes. But there's a time and a place to display that. I agree with that. You know, it's not like, (laughs) you know, we all have bad days. Yeah. Whether you're a man or whether you're a a woman. Like, we have bad days. Mm -hmm. It's just learn how to process things appropriately. That's my thought. Yeah. Yeah. So what projects are you working on now? So I have um, a little EP coming out. So EP is just like uh, an extended play, which supposedly it means like it's an old term. Like when they see those vinyls, it's okay. like it's not just a single one song, but it's not a full album. So it's an EP and it has five songs, 18 minutes long. And it's just puras canciones de mi abuelo. So songs that my grandfather sang. Um, 
three of them, three tracks are from a concert that happened in Idaho. So you can kind of get the experience of what, what, what it's like to be in a concert there with me. It's a lot mm -hmm. of fun. And then there's two of them that are live um, that we just did like in my suegra's living room. And then where was the other one? Oh, yeah. In Marquez Clásico, they're um, amazing hat makers. Oh, he made me mine. I got to go pick it up. Oh, you got, yeah. Well, he's been on the podcast. He was here like episode 17 or something like oh, that. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, he made me one that has the True Hustle logo on there. Oh, that's awesome. Tejana. That's right. Okay, yeah. so we did one at his space, the Marquez Clásico space, the new, the new spot. Oh, that's dope. Um, So we did one there. And yeah, so that's that's a little EP coming out. It's live music. And then we're just working. We That's what we do. We just work on music. We're traveling all over. Um, we have a few concerts coming out, uh, coming up in L.A. We have one August 31st. Where? At the Levitt Pavilion, which is in MacArthur Park. You know, me equivoco, right? Fact check me on that. Are we going to be? <laughs> oh, we're going to be in Texas that day, huh? On the 31st. Okay. Uh, okay. And then which other ones? Like, um, I gotta go. I, think I gotta go to one. LA. That's the only one for now. Cause the way it works, like I can only do a certain amount of concerts in LA, and then you kind of like burn the market, and you have to wait a period of time. Oh really? So yeah. it's like a strategy? No, it's like a thing. Like they there's um there's like clauses in contracts where it's like you're only gonna play this city once in like three months and it's like okay because they don't what? want they don't want competition really like, yeah like this venue over here doesn't want to compete with that venue so you can't do too many shows in one place at the same time really yeah so anyway i'm i'm doing the la show and then for now august 31st i don't know if there's going to be more coming up there's going to be one in in mexico and escondido in November. Okay, okay. And oh, Vegas Rumbazo Fest in Vegas. When? Um, that's September that 14th and 15th. So it's like a music oh, festival. Oh, that one we go to. Yeah. Oh, the yeah. fight is happening that weekend. Oh yeah, yeah. So mm, I'm performing yes. on the 14th <laughs> Friday. And the fight is on Saturday. It's on Saturday, right? Yeah. So everyone come to the festival on friday for sure and where can i get the tickets on rumbasofest.com rumbaso with the z i heard i'm gonna have to go to that one com. yeah that's gonna be fun in vegas it's an easy flight from la so what music what singers influenced you aside from the obvious your grandfather and your father like what music did you grow up listening to um a little bit of everything. Um, like at home, it was one thing. On the radio, it was another thing. Mm -hmm. um, like at home, I think my mom would listen to like Juan Gabriel, Lupita D'Alessio. Um, she listened to a lot of Pedro Infante too. Um, on the radio, there was a lot of R&B. Like I know so many random R&B songs for no reason. Los Temerarios? <laughs> nah, nah, it was not, not, not really. <laughs> <laughs> it was just not something that I grew up listening to. Okay. Um, a little bit, a little bit of Chalino here and there, like my tío, um, trying to think. Um, and then, and then I got into my own taste, so I was, like, listening to, like, No Doubt. Mm. A lot of, like, ska music. I don't know if you were into that scene. Like what? Like what kind of? Like the backyard gigs that they would do, and they would have, like, ska bands, punk bands. All Not really. over South Central. It's like punker stuff, right? Kind of, yeah. But not Nirvana. No. Kind of similar to it? No, no, no. no. That's more grungy. Yeah more 90s and then this was more like ska like um mm. like there was a band called viernes 13 chencha berrinches there was okay. um, mata mosca there was all these local like groups that were 
that were playing at the Allen. Oh, shit, at the Allen <laughs> Dam. So I, I was very into that, very influenced by that. Um, and then Selena. Oh, Selena. My first, like, karaoke machine, my first, like, CD for that karaoke machine was a Selena karaoke CD, so. You sing Bidi Bidi Bam Bam? Yeah. <laughs> Como La Flor? Yeah, yeah. She's yeah. the legend. I listen to that. I would listen to everything. Like, me growing up. I went through phases like rap, yeah, and then Nirvana, rap and then Chalino, and then the Spanish scene, and then Voces de Rancho. Like, and it's like, like in my car right now. Like my playlist is just everything. Some days yeah. I'm feeling like Nirvana. Some days I'm feeling like rap. Tupac. It's just it ranges. Yeah, so. Eminem was my first concert. Which on the the anger management tour, back then? Uh, Remember that? Shit, I went to it. You did? I th I was like in. I must have been like eighth grade, seventh, yeah. eighth grade. So I don't even. I don't remember. But oh yeah, because you're a little bit younger tickets, than me. Though I think we won tickets on Power One Hundred Six. Damn, Power One Hundred Six giving, six, giving out. Shit, that's dope. And yeah, Eminem was dope. It's super dope. You have any questions? Anything you want to add, sir, Mr. Husband? How long? Okay. This has been good. <laughs> I've been waiting for freaking three months or four <laughs> months, and it finally happened. You finally came through, yeah. and it means a lot to me. Oh, and I you. hope that everybody taps into your concerts. They start following you on social media. And they get to see how talented you are. Thank you. Thank you. And not just because you're from Huntington Park. <laughs> I'm saying this. It's because I mean it. And thank you so much for stopping by. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank Lupita you. Infante. Make sure you follow her and make sure yes. you buy all the tickets to her concerts. Let's go, baby. <laughs> and we're out.